Um, so my name is Eric Klein. Um, our farm is Hidden Stream Farm. We're in Elgin, Minnesota, which is by Rochester in the southeast corner. Um, we're a small family farm. We do direct marketing. We do distribution. Um, I'll kind of touch on what, you know, kind of towards the end is the actual processing plant, but really what, what led to why did we want to delve into such a monumental task. Um, we did a we went all out, we didn't do on farm. We went off, off site in another small town. So um, I'll get, get into that, but it's a plant that can accommodate a lot, of, a lot of other farmers in the area, and it is USDA. So, you know, the real background is, you know, the reason we've started what we did is because we were a small farm. We couldn't couldn't compete with the big boys and how to be a least cost producer. So we always knew direct marketing was the way we had to go. And how are we gonna do that and be able to add value to the products? Um, so uh, two things, we raise grass-fed beef. We do about, about 100, 150 grass-fed beef. We buy yearlings and then we finish them out. We do about 1,500 hogs a year. Uh, we, again, we buy feeder pigs. I work with another farm who supplies me with the feeder pigs. We bring them in about 60 pounds and then we finish them up to about 280 pounds. And then our pasture, pasture broilers, uh, we do about 3,000 of them between April 15th and try to be done by middle of October. Um, trying to space things out. It's still an evolution of getting the timing just right so you get a little break and a little rest. Um, so we are the third generation. You know, as I said, we started direct marketing. So in 1999, uh, when our first kid, about the same time as our first kid was born, so we have six kids, um, we uh, started with the farmer's market and trying to, to break into that. Oops. Um, with that, we, if you're familiar with the uh, Land Stewardship Project in Minnesota, they were one of the originators of the, the Farm Beginnings programs. And when they all got going, uh, my father-in-law was actually one of the originators of that program in itself. So we were in the second class and we've helped other farmers along the way through mentorships and things like that. Um, they said we were just, just young, trying to figure out how to, how to be outside the box and not compete with everybody else. Uh, when we got started, hogs were low. We knew that wasn't the way to go. So we kind of, you know, it forces you to figure out what your costs are, what you need to operate, and um, kept us always moving forward, always looking for new ideas and ways to evolve and become better, and lots and lots of mistakes. That's a whole other day in itself <laughs> of all the things we've done wrong and mistakes. and. Um, so as we evolved, and as our name, as our product got recognition, um, we always had processors, small processors to work with. So we, we kept developing products, we kept growing our markets, um, and then we were able to expand in about 2002. Uh, we went from just being that small farm where people in town could come out or we'd do one little farmer's market or one and a half type of deal, a little small town, we'd do Rochester, to really become a, more in the local food scene. Uh, local food was pretty much its infancy back then. Nobody, it was kind of a whim. Even bankers were like, you know, this is just a whim. It's a fad, nothing's ever gonna stick. Well, I think everybody here can attest that it's not a fad anymore. We've all done quite pretty well. What would yeah. you say is the catalyst for that? Of making that next jump? I would say production. We finally had a good handle on where production was. And just that mindset, OK, we need to bump up. Had more kids, <laughs> mouths to feed. <laughs> How are we going to get more money in? You know, what's the bottom line? Um, and we actually, you know, 
your product travels farther than you and word of mouth travels farther than you. So the other driving force was people calling us in the cities and chefs having our product or uh, many of you work, probably work with chefs. Chefs move like the wind. You know, one guy who was at Rochester decided to go to Minneapolis and then he's like, oh, I've had this great stuff. You know, how can we, how can we get your product up there? So we made that transition with just a couple of customers and a couple of clients um, to be able to just start transporting product up there. You know, it just starts very small with just a few hogs going up, um, beef, chicken, and then just kind of keep expanding from there. So with that, as that evolved then we became, you know, the go-to. We developed, we were kind of one of the first ones to actually offer the one-stop shopping where the big distributors have that already in place, the Cisco's, the Reinhardt's. We became that one-stop shop for local food, at least in our region. So in our corner of southeast Minnesota, we evolved to be able to offer chefs not only our meat products, but now they could source vegetables from us. They could source eggs, honey, fruits, and they really liked that. So Lisa, my wife, she'll send out lists to all the restaurants. Um, there must be like 200 restaurants or chefs on her email list. Um, and they, all, they, don't, they don't all order all the time, but at least they're all up to date. What's going on on the farm? These are what's available. We keep in contact with all of our growers. Um, the meat business price stays pretty static as far as what your production is. So that's pretty much an even keel of what anybody wants they can get. So how did you, you went something out there. You went from, okay, <laughs> we're going to do this to suddenly we've done it. Uh, so how did you suddenly become a food distributor? Just, it was an organic, it was actually an organic growth to where people just you're wanted to be. You're not producing anything but those, but the proteins, right? Correct. So you've got a bunch of other people that you're distributing their product. We are taking ownership of their product. So you're buying it. Yep. We buy their product as an, on an as-needed basis. And then we distribute that. What does as-needed mean here? Are people putting in orders? Right. In the meantime, or are you stocking stuff? No. So a chef, everything is picked pick to order. So a chef, the chef's order on say Monday, everything is harvested on Tuesday, packed and delivered to us on Wednesday, and it's on their, on their step on Thursday. How, how do you feel about your traceability program? Um, we're small enough that it's, it's very good. We know exactly who we are. We're on a one-to-one -one basis. How many producers do you have that you're buying product from? We have about well, if, if you include the, uh, the Amish, you know, we've got about 20, 20 different producers. But you're not complete enough that they can replace the system. They still are getting Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Right. No, this just gives another, <coughs> another added option, you know. For the, the, the people wanted to be able to source local food, but they don't have time. <coughs> The gardeners, the farmers, they don't have the time. We offered that, that in-between service. Did you end up hiring people to manage the business? My wife and I manage the business. Is it seasonal? Or do you seasonal as far as the, the crop within itself. But the business runs, runs 52 weeks a year. Because storage vegetables, um, <coughs> Our, our produce farmers, our vegetable farmers, um, egg producers, they all run, um, you know, they have stored crops that we can help capitalize and market on that. Yep. So your chefs are okay with frozen product the other times of the year when you're not seasonally producing, say like poultry? Um, the poultry is the only thing we sell frozen. And they're, yes, that's, that's the one thing they have to be fine with. But um, all of our other proteins are fresh, unless there's some specialty. In order to meet that demand, what were, what were the production challenges to meet year-round? On the protein side? 
Um, processing challenges, you know, as far as production, you know, you just have to keep that consistent flow, of, that consistent flow going of the proteins. You know, the, the chickens are only summer based, so they're a frozen product. But we continually, we don't just, that's why we don't farrow anymore, we just buy feeder pigs. So every six weeks we always have a continuous, continuous flow. So we, right. So you always have to oversupply, you know, or over, overproduce to supply what you need, you know. So we, we try to keep 100%, 100% sold this way, but sometimes you do get over, over supplied and then you use the commodity market which is the nice thing about being in the protein business. You know, people, the rabbits are a big discussion that comes and goes. I know people, people are raising them. I don't hear a lot of people selling them. We, we haven't sold any rabbits. We get people that ask, the ones that ask, they want a cheaper product than what people are willing to, to sell them for. Um, offhand, I don't even know what that price range is. But they're like, well, we have so-and-so has rabbits, but you know, they're a dollar a pound higher than what he wants, he being the chef, wants to pay. What, can you give a, a ballpark idea of just what, the, what it is for like a whole chicken in terms of how, how the, what the price the chefs pay a range? Uh, they're doing on a wholesale to chefs. We're at two seventy-five. Okay. Correct. Or no, per pound. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> per pound. Yeah. yeah no. That's our that's our challenge. That's the challenge of being a fresh meat distributor. You need to sell that, and what doesn't then goes in the freezer, and has to be added to value some other way. That's the the challenge of the meat business. Um, like I said, the the core business still still remains our meat business because that's the the premise of what our farm is. No, well, we just use a forage. It's a forage, a forage feed. We don't do any grain. We don't do any soy hulls or distillers. We're just 100% forage fed. You know, that whole, the grass fed's kind of a, but in Minnesota, it's kind of hard to, especially with all the snow today we had. Um, like I said, as we evolved, you guys are getting ahead of me. Um, so did the products. Um, the fresh, fresh never frozen, you know, that's huge. We can actually, by, by doing that also allows us to expand more on our, our farmer's market sales or direct sales to customers that they don't have to, you know, everybody else is doing a frozen product that's cut in advance and stored. Like, I what? Mean, you encourage them to take um, sides or to take, like, instead, like with pigs, they're taking all the loins. And mm -hmm. Maybe they occasionally want to show them here or there. But We've, you know, in the early days, that was very, very difficult. You know, some things didn't move, but, you know, as you're in the business and as you talk to people, it starts to balance out. Um, so, you know, like we moved just a, a ton of bacon and we've added value to our ham. We do a shaved sliced ham that sandwich shops use, you know, shoulders are go fast. You can always turn stuff into trim and sausage. Um, you have to think out of the box for that. Right. Okay. Yeah. You have to, to plan ahead. You know, back in the early days, it was a lot easier. People were into the, the whole animal and as things are getting tougher, the restaurant business, especially in Minneapolis, has been under a lot of pressure. Uh, minimum wage laws are $15 an hour. Uh, the restaurants are feeling it. They're looking more, they want to buy local, but they also have to watch their bottom line. 
as fast as restaurants open, five more, five open, five close all in the same week. Um, so the, we worked with some Amish farms, um, get the organic eggs. We have other producers that do pasture raised eggs. Um, with Minnesota law, as long as they're, our numbers are small enough, as long as they're inspected and verified and certified through the state of Minnesota, we can, they, they accept the responsibility for packaging their eggs. So we follow under, under their exemption. We have a retail food handler's license, so we, so we can. You know, as long as it's under constant refrigeration, we can do that. And it's all packaged USDA. That, that license, how onerous was that process and how expensive is it to maintain? Um, the, the annual fees are based on sales. Um, the initial, your initial cost is basically in having a quality means to transport your product. You can't get away with just dragging coolers down the curb in Minnesota. I know people in Wisconsin, they, they can get away with that. But <laughs> hey, good for them. But yeah. But um, in Minnesota, you have four hours. Four, you can be unplugged for four hours without mechanical refrigeration. So, depending on your drive and all that, you have to be, get there, be plugged in. You know, so we have, have freezers, our trailer, we have a six by, 12, six by 12 trailer, and we have three freezers in there, all commercial NSF freezers. So the first time you set up, they come out, they inspect your trailer, they write you the license, and then it's pretty much just a renewal, unless they want to come out, you know. Through our distribution, we've, had to re, re, redo them to also a, what Minnesota, Minnesota calls a wholesale food handler's license in addition. But, but it's not, you know, if you do things right and you keep it clean and you keep it legal, you're not making any trouble for yourself. So it's, it's an easy process. Um, just as, like I'll get into with the USDA, all you hear are horror stories. Why in the world would you go USDA? They're awful, but if you just do it right, don't, don't cause trouble. Life's, life's not that bad. Um, something new, you know, as people learn more about who we are, where we go, we get, get questions from people. Can you find me this? The chefs say, can you find me this? I'm looking for a certain type of apple, a variety. We've got an orchard down the road who was one of the developers of the Honeycrisp or the Pizzazz. So, we can go there, and we always have full transparency with our customers. If it's not organic, or if it's not really grown in Minnesota, you know, we say, you know, and we, we're small enough to be able to have that relationship and say, hey, the orchard down the road has got apples, 88 count the way you want them, or 110s, but they're coming out of their Washington orchard. Do you still want them? And they'd be like, yeah, this is the price, and they're, they're fine with that. And again, it's that traceability, the one-on-one -on -one relationship, you know, and it's a good, good stage that we like to be at. Um, we get honey, we get, you know, can't wait for the morels and ramps to start. You know, we'll move just a ton of them. We have a Amish lady that grows asparagus. She has like 10 acres of asparagus, you know, and she texts too. <laughs> I don't know where she gets her phone, but she'll text Lisa and say, how much do you need, or I've got this many, or the frost come, comes in. You know, there's another Amish in Wisconsin. I think he's got 30 acres of asparagus. It's just amazing. So that, that's actually, so we have an Amish community about 25 miles from us, and they do a produce auction twice a week. So we utilize that quite a bit. We can get the, the volume for, for our larger accounts that want to buy bins and full pallets. So that's just a little one-day deal. I guess you can see their straw hats. Um, so really, why, why did we do this? You know, the changes. Um, I met with a guy, and he brought up a great term. 
that these old plants that are aging were all built during the creamery generation. I don't know how many of you know what that means, but all these small towns all had a meat plant and a creamery for all the bottled milk to come in. And a lot of us, that's what we're dealing with right now, is plants that were built in that, that era. And they're, they're still running. Some are kind of like the old dairies, you know, they don't want to update them. They're getting tired, the family doesn't want to come in. Um, so we're, we're dealing with an aging infrastructure. And as more and more direct marketers are wanting to get stuff processed, we're running into that, that brick in the road, I guess, that just kind of stops and slows everything down as far as everybody that wants to really grow their, grow their businesses. Um, and with that, they, you know, they were built to handle Farmer Joe brings in a couple animals for his family and friends. You know, it's just a cut, wrap, and freeze. Um, this is the way we make our bacon. This is the way we make our ham. This is the way we make our sausage. And everybody's fine with that. Um, we went to our processor at the time and said we want to develop an uncured. That's where the market's leading. So they were good and they worked with us and we developed through a lot of trial and error. A lot of bad product went, went out the door or went in the tank, I should say. Um, but we've got some really popular products. Um, and a lot of back-breaking work. Nobody's built, nobody's got loading docks. So you're, you know, you're loading out 20, 30 hogs a day, or, you know, that, that's about what we process a week. So you're, that's all boxed up and you're either throwing it up into a truck or piling it on a lift gate trying to get into a truck. And, you know, you're dealing with wet weather and rain and snow and heat, you know, worrying about product. Um, so, and again, as I'll go get to in a few before or after this, you know, there was no middle. There is no middle. You're either big or you're little for processing. Um, and we kind of fell into that, fell into that niche. So, I said that the aging plants, we wanted to keep growing. We were kind of at a roadblock of what our small plants could do. Um, we're fortunate in the fact in our, in Southeast Minnesota, we've got like three or four USDA plants, all small plants. Some nobody goes to for certain reasons. Other ones are so busy you can't get into. Um, a lot of plants I think throughout the country are booked out six months to a year in advance. You know, when that animal's born, you better call and get an appointment for it. It's just, just crazy. Um, so we still, so when we built Dover, we wanted to be able to expand, expand, which is what we did. We added, increased our bacon production, we increased our ham production, um, increased what we were able to do with our cuts and sausage and um, do the portions, you know, we bought equipment that could be able to make a, a length that was only an ounce or two ounces so that they could do whatever they, you know, cater more to the chef instead of saying, this is what I have, you know, I hope you can work with this. Um, and by cut to spec, um, you know, if, so if I took 100 pigs to a, a big processor, I would get a standard cut of how all my loins would be done one way or within a, a range. Um, all your shoulders would be done one way. It would all be primaled out. Um, there was nobody in that middle ground that could handle what we did or what, we're, what we are doing now. To be able to handle the volume, be able to handle the distribution, accept incoming pallets. And that was kind of the, the key of what we wanted to accomplish with Dover. Um, so as we went through this process, it was just a, how do we want to do this? What do we want it to look like? Um, it spent spent a lot of time. So I spent, uh, so we opened in June of 2017, about, was it, eight, nine months ago. Um, the first three, four years prior to that was all spent developing this. We've looked at several sites, looked at purchasing other processors. Um, nothing ever 
came together or the timing was right. Um, and finally, finally we, we found a site, um, worked with uh, Jan, and she had made it in. Renewing the countryside was a big, big help to us. Um, and how were we going to put all that together? I just, it was really an advantage to take, take your time on something this big and just work through it and be patient. I know some who have tried and built it fast, thought it looked really easy, and they're already closed. Um, we met a lot of people. I met a guy who designs plants, um, kind of helped us with a layout, helped us with a rail system, um, put us in touch with equipment, gave us time to interview different equipment people, refrigeration people, and really just work through that process, who's going to work, who's not. I feel like I can get a better deal here. Yeah, he whined and dined me, but I like the way he sounds better, rather than just going to this guy that whined and dined you and say, all in, you know, how much is it going to cost me? Um, and we really picked and choosed on how we wanted to do this, because there's companies out there that'll build this whole thing for you for a whole lot more money. Um, so we were never really, you know, it was always great to have that idea of let's be on the farm or let's be so close I can just drive over there quick or hop on a four wheel or the kids can run over. But again, as that process evolved, it's like, you know, maybe that's not what's important. You know, one, we're going to be USDA location for other customers. This isn't just about us. So how are we going to, where's a good spot for this? Um, and actually, one of my biggest driving factors was the gentleman who was going to be my plant manager, who was the guy who was going to be there seven days a week, checking on things and making sure it was right. He's the one who came to me and said, hey, I got a spot, and it's only like two miles from my house, 12 miles for me, but you know, he's the one who's living there. So we, we looked at the space. It was a vacant building. They did flooring for a few years. and partnerships and divorces and it just sat empty. So another company had bought it, hoping to develop it, never did anything with it. So it sat empty for like four or five years and the building was only like six years old. So I tried. They said no thank you. <laughs> they had gave 30000 to the original guys who built the building and got zero dollars back and they just kind of said if you want it, there it is. <laughs> so I really had no support. I just knew something that we needed to do. It just kind of felt right. Just to change um, your yourself that we were just talking about, that at least didn't need any managers while the development process was In the beginning, no. We were all kind of in this for the, for the right reasons. Um, when we got into the construction phase, then I thought I could let him stay at his current job, but it became obvious very quickly when we started doing construction that I needed, I needed his expertise, and so I brought him on full time on salary. Um, do you have a retail uh, case right there at your plant? We do, yeah. So while the city wouldn't give us any money, they did say, we really want you to have a real retail space. <laughs> so. <laughs> That was pretty bold of them. They also wanted us to put a gas station on there, but I won that one. <laughs> yeah, don't ask. <laughs> they, this little town's just hung up on that the gas station's going to bring people into their town. <laughs> I don't write it. So, but you know, the advantage was we didn't have to dig a well. We didn't have to worry about sewer. We didn't have to worry about groundwater, any of that stuff. It was a uh, once we. The building was there once we did the concrete and the floors, tapped into the city water, city electric or the electric was there. We ran a 480 line from a 2, 220 line. Um, but in that sense, it was pretty turnkey. You didn't have to go through all the testing. We called the city and get their test water results. Right. Good, good question. Um, it was, it's actually in an industrial area. 
Um, our attorney, another important person, went through all their, went through, read through their, what is listed as industrial on their guidelines, and it didn't specifically call out meat processing, so we went and had that changed at a city council meeting. So it is called in there, but there was pushback. You know, people have these images that we're gonna be like, killing animals in the middle of the road, you know. <laughs> yeah, just blood everywhere and garbage and, you know, and we're very, you know, we're very conscious of that. But just, just the mentality of what, what people think is coming down the pike because they just have absolutely no idea. So. But was there any issues with, uh, with the amount of uh, um, bioorganic um, stuff that's going down the sewer? Does, it, does, the, does the city have a, just a, um, a lagoon or an actual problem? So, in our area, there's actually like three towns on one line that all runs into a bigger town. So they were just like, I mean, we did put a grease interceptor. It's like a big, it's another septic tank outside that collects the solids. So we actually have two separate lines coming out of the building, one for waste, one for grease and stuff like that. So um, we're better than another old plant that's up the road that sends everything. But... Um, the town, St. Charles, down where everything goes, they had a big food processing company downtown years ago that caught fire. So their, their entire system's only running at about 40%. So they're more than happy to have us. So it was just a really, really, really good fit of how this was all gonna play out. Um, water pressure in that town, in this little town, they said, we don't even need fire trucks. We're running 80 PSI. We just turned the hydrants on. <laughs> So um, from that, that standpoint, they've all been very well. And the, the people in the town have received us well. I haven't had any complaints. Um, I heard you mention your rail system. Does your rail run from bolt to freezer? Or do you have a stop in between the kill floor? Um, the last process where I was viewing, they had a uh, rail system that ran from the kill floor all the way through, all the way into the freezer. Um, ours just runs from the kill floor through the, we got a pre-chill for carcasses to a holding cooler and it just runs out to the processing floor and it dead, dead ends there to where the animals get broke down. We never run whole carcasses into a freezer. Okay, in like a processing room or whatever, yep. So, yeah, it's all, there's, each room's got like four tracks and you can just run the switches and, you know, yep. Uh, not, not very many, but <laughs> if I could get my computer, I'd have a few, but. So that was kind of how, how we financed it. We did use some government money. Um, <clears throat> I left off the MDA, the Minnesota Department of Ag. We got a grant through them just to kind of offset some equipment costs. Not, nothing huge, but everything helps. Um, so after many years, you know, we completed it. The contractors were very patient, lots of revisions. We got to the point where we didn't even know which blueprint we were looking at anymore. We finally had to start, start putting them in the garbage and kind of decide on where we were at and how we were going to make it go. Um, but once we got, got going, we were just amazed that, you know, to basically gut the building, we tore out all the concrete because every room has to have drains. Every room has to be sloped. Um, we put in-floor heat through the whole plant, unless it's, unless it's a refrigerated room. Um, they got all that done in six months. That's refrigeration installed, equipment installed, building done. Um, and then, you know, people always talk about the USDA and how, you know, the USDA rules is they won't talk to you they won't say yay or nay until it's all said and done. Um, but we had a pretty good, comp pretty good relationship already because we'd already been processing USDA. So we knew, that we, we knew the inspectors, we knew the regional guys in the area. So we were able to talk to them, set up meetings on site, and say, hey, 
even when it was just a, a shell of a building, you know, the blueprint on a hood of a truck, and say, this is, what I, this is my dream, you know, what do you guys think? And then as it got going, we'd bring them in several times, like when the pipes, before we poured over the pipes for the drains and the water lines, you know, hey, what do you think? Here's your office, and we even gave you a bathroom with a shower, and that makes them really happy. But um, to just be able to get that feedback, you know, and they'd be like, well, here's so-and-so regulations you can look at, you know, and these are links to this. And so it wasn't until the final, the final grant and when we finally said, okay, come on in, you know, then they go through, but they already, they already knew what they were looking at, so it was very, very simple. Um, so that's why I was saying, you know, and even they said, we can't really tell you what to do, but we can nudge you. And I was, I can read between the lines. We, that, that's fine, we can do that. <laughs> we're kind of in the middle. <laughs> no, we're about, it's about one and a half million, a little over. That's a 8,600 8, square foot building. What, what approach is there to processing the company at the plant, or what are, what are you capable of processing there? So we do beef, pigs, lambs, goats, um, even got no poultry. No. We don't want to go down. Pardon me? Are they are farmers processing the poultry? Or the uh, there's a USDA processing oh. poultry plant. Not too far, actually, from where that Amish auction is. So, which is on a year-by-year -year basis if they're going to stay open. But we hold our breath. What was the decision not to do poultry? What occurred to that? Just the confusion and the cross-contamination. Putting poultry and red meat together is just something we didn't want to go down. We, we do do poultry further processing, so which means, so I've got a, a friend who's in the turkey business. Um, we'll devote an area, or we bring in his stuff, we'll process his, um, his turkey. Oh, I'm sorry, no, I don't know how long to say. Um, so we'll, we'll bring in his ground turkey, his <laughs> ingredients. We'll, fat, we'll do all of his co-packing, so, but we're not actually physically, physically doing any processing. But we, when we registered for our grant, we also have, we have a, an M, which is meat, the red meat, and we have a, a P number for our plant number, so we can do, do uh, secondary poultry or any type of processing beyond the actual slaughter. That was another question. Oh. Um, so I'd say, yeah, 60, well, I just had a call today, but um, we're running about 65%. Um, still working through the bugs. Labor's always always a challenge in any market. Um, if you read in the Wall Street Journal, Iowa's like the worst for, for labor right now. There are not more jobs than there is labor. Um, we're not in Iowa, but we're pretty close to being in the same same sector. Are you going to talk about like the range of meat processing? I can. I'm curious. Right. So we do ourselves, I was going to mention first, like our capacity, what we're set up for is we're, we're set up to do 20, our rail space is 20 beef a day. So, you know, it, it's going to take a lot to get to that spot. So 20 beef equates to about 40 hogs. And then you can go down from there for lambs or stuff like that. And then that's our, our pre-chill, our holding cooler holds about 24 animals. But that's just, if you've got the flow and you've got the people. Um, again, with the old plants, there was one cooler. The carcass went in, it went out. There was a lot of hot carcasses going into cold carcasses. Everything we do is segregated. It goes into a pre-chill, gets cooled down to temp within 24 hours, and then it gets moved into the, the holding cooler. If it's pork, as was spoke before, um, you know, Pork gets processed the next day. Uh, if it's beef, it'll hang. Some customers want it to hang a week. Some want it 10 to 12 days. Some want three or four weeks. Uh, we charge extra if they want to go past that 12 to 14 days, just because you're, you're taking up real estate that we need to keep turning. 
Um, so as far as our different customers, um, you know, we built it in the attention for Hidden Stream Farm with the ability to handle other, other farmers. So now we're bringing in a whole diversity of direct marketers that also want their pork, their lamb, their beef processed. And then we'll cut. Most of that all gets froze. Uh, we've got a lot of guys who just want to bring in a beef or two or three, and they've got it sold by quarters and halves to friends and family all over the place. And we can package for all that. So, like I said, that's where we're that middle ground. We're that guy that can, can cut a quarter of beef to somebody's order if they want 10 pounds of hamburger patties and 30 pounds of one pound chubs, and then they want their steaks inch and a half thick, we can do that, you know. And we have, we've really invested a lot in packaging. We can do anything, I guess we could do paper, we don't do it, but um, we do everything vacuum packed, or we have a machine called a roll stock machine. If you're in any of the stores and you see that nice black back package, so I should have brought the prop. <laughs> um, and then it's got that nice clear film, we can do that. You can see your, your snack sticks in the store that have that nice plastic and that little skin over top and the stick pops up, we can do that. Or summer sausage or anything like that. So we're kind of, we're covering a lot of ground and we're doing a lot of different stuff. Um, but we, we, we don't want to be, be limiting in what we can do. We want to be able to you know, as we get, get growing, we'll probably start zeroing in and targeting more, more specialized, but. Are you able to do a kosher collab then? We've had people come in and bless, you know, on occasion. Um, we do some uh, Muslim, Muslim come in. We had a lady come in. You know, some guy brought in two beef and they were, I don't know if the, the one talk about naming your pets, I think Greg Judy was saying. <laughs> you know, it was Marvin and Henry or something like that, and they had to have the tags to match with it. So we're like, whatever. <laughs> but um, yeah, we're, we're very accommodating. Um, Jeff, my plant manager, he's, you know, I'd be lost without him. He's a very good guy, hardworking. So I need to finish up here. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> so we, again, we went with USDA just so we could expand more so we could work with people. We're in that southeast corner. We bring people from Wisconsin. We bring people from Iowa. Iowa, they can't find USDA because of their region, everybody's state. And a lot of people down there want to expand markets and go other places. Um, so. That's about the best picture I got. I tried to do some video, some fancy video, but it never, we've been so busy, I didn't get it done. Um, so, I mean, that was kind of the, the main thing. We wanted to help the rural community. We wanted to help the small farms. It's not just about us. We built it to be able to, to grow and do more with people. And, you know, we got started. We wanted other people to be able to get started direct marketing too, and local, you know, create jobs. There's a lot of people that, now they, they appreciate not having to go to drive all the way to Rochester, especially when it's snowy. <laughs>